Oh, that's not fair. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> everybody. Um, I'm Domna Schmiller, and welcome to Writer's Roundtable. Um, tonight, we have an exciting presentation for you, but before we start, we're going to have Adam Bentz of the York History Center come up and talk, give us a little rundown of things that are the York History Center. Hello. Right, yeah. Hello, everybody. Um, I just have a handful of things. Uh, you're probably all aware that the York County History Center museums and library and archives are currently closed. Uh, we're trying to get the word out and you probably are very well aware that we're moving to a state-of-the-art museum in a historic building. And uh, one of us tonight is an expert on the history of that building. Mm -hmm. So I'm not gonna point him out, but anyway. Um, so uh, unfortunately, over the next few months, we're going to be spending most of our time packing and moving and getting used to our new building and getting it ready for the general public. We hope to open to members in June and the general public in July of 2024. Uh, but all of our sites are currently closed. Our seasonal sites, which includes the Colonial Complex, the Ag Agricultural and Industrial Museum, and our fire museum will reopen in April, 2024. So some of our sites will be able to open in the next few months, uh, which is great. We will continue to hold programs such as this one and other partner programs, uh, such as the York Civil War Roundtable and the All Vets organization in this meeting hall uh, through June of 2024 until we're ready to start public programs at the Steve Plant Building. I just have one upcoming announcement, which is it's hard to believe there's only one. Usually I have five or six uh, because we have lots of different things going on most of the time. But um, <laughs> with the closure and uh, and the season, just have one coming up um, in a little over a month of January 17th, 2024. The York Civil War Roundtable will meet here on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock p.m. And the roundtable will be welcoming Janet. I don't know what I'm saying. We will not be meeting in person on January 17th. I don't even have that written. We will not be meeting in person. We will be doing this online, hosted most likely by myself. Uh, this will be a Zoom webinar, which we've done uh, in previous years. We certainly did it during COVID. And uh, in 2023, earlier this year, January, February, we did Zoom webinars. So please check out our website for that. Um, it will be a Zoom only webinar, uh, Zoom and Facebook Live. And the speaker will be Janet E. Kroon, who will be presenting The War Outside My Window, The Civil War Diary of Leroy Wiley Gresham, 1860 to 1865. So like I said, that's, uh, that's something you can register for on our website. It's free of charge. Um, and it will be an online program in January, January 17th. So that's all I have. Uh, so thanks very much. So I'm uh, Jim McClure, and uh, this is the time when we're, we offer to, for any of the clubs and organizations uh, that are here, and those that you represent, to uh, come up and uh, pitch your projects that are coming up or your meetings and so on. Any uh, Anybody want to pitch? Stephen? Uh, two talks. April of next year, April 10th. During the day, I have an Ollie talk on the first 60 years of York Corporation, which takes you from uh, 1874 to 1934. Uh, that's an update of a talk I presented about 10 years ago at Ollie. Uh, so I have a lot of new stuff in there. Uh, also, in the evening of April 10th, I'll be presenting uh, the Springsbury History Night. Uh, I've been uh, and I plotted to do a talk on Mail and Haynes. So I'm doing like a full hour and 20 minute talk on Mail and Haynes. Uh, that basically comes from uh, my meetings with him. And uh, I did a, a little paper in high school, uh, high school history class. I think it was uh, 11th grade history class. We were told to do something about a local celebrity. 
So I went in the Martin Library and said, name some local celebrities. <laughs> and she started naming stuff. And then she got the Milan Haynes and said, do you have any information? We have six scrapbooks of him. So I, I went through, I did a paper on uh, 11th grade on him and uh, uh, a lot of information in that. So I pulled from that information because that includes stuff that when the time that I met him, it includes that stuff also. Uh, and then on, uh, in 1891 or 1991, when Springsbury did their book on the uh, 100th anniversary of the township, uh, more pages are devoted to Mail and Haynes than any other individual in that book. And they just pulled from those scrapbooks. And I discovered there's a, a, a master's thesis for American studies at Harrisburg, campus of Penn State, uh, done, I think it was in 2001 on Mail and Haynes. So uh, there's a lot of in information to pull from. So I'm gonna pull from all those sources uh, and some little known things. So that'll be on April 10th. And I'm currently working on some articles uh, associated with the steam plant. Uh, so that's taking up some of my time. I'm rewriting an article on that. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Uh, Stephen uh, was referencing a special journal we have coming out this year, the Journal of York County Heritage through the York County History Center. And that's going to focus on the steam plant and the trolley system that was associated with that. So uh, any anyone else, uh, Don? Hi, it's me again. Um, so I run the Preserving the History of Newburytown site on Facebook, but I also took over the Lewis Berry Lovers um, History Group as well this year. And in January, on January 11th, actually, on Thursday, January 11th, we will have a presentation by Jerry Jones, the geologist at the Redland Senior Center, and that is open to anyone um, to the public, and that's at 12.20 p.m., and uh, Jim McClure and myself and Jamie Norpel will be teaching a class for Ollie um, about the bridges of the Susquehanna in January. Also, you can uh, sign up for that and um, you do have to sign up ahead of time for the class. Anyone else? Since I'm here in person, I'm, I usually Zoom. Uh, I just did want to mention uh, the two main things that I do continuing research on, uh, which is the, the Pennsylvania German birth and uh, baptism certificates, the Proctor certificates, and uh, <clears throat> that I've been I've been working on for about 25 years. It was my master's thesis, and we turned it into, into a book uh, about 15, 20 years ago. Uh, but I'm still doing research because there's still a lot of information out there. So every now and then I make a plea. If anyone has any uh, birth, uh, the birth and baptismal certificates, uh, I would love to see photos of them uh, because my database is over 2,000 now just for the York County area, York Adams and Northern Maryland. And there's still a lot of mysteries as to artists and scriveners and, uh, and the family ties are interesting too. So if anyone has any uh, I would love to see them. Um, you can Google me, uh, universal, my universal your blog has some contact information. Uh, and uh, so that's one thing. The other thing is camp security. Uh, I'm on the board of the Friends of Camp Security, and you might know that we had finally, at the last year, found uh, at least part of uh, the stockade where the Revolutionary War prisoners of war, the British uh, prisoners, were held. Uh, so as we raise the money to do continuing digs, we will be uh, uh, uncovering more of that. And uh, I uh, concentrate on the guards. Uh, I spend a lot of time at the National Archives uh, finding pension records, but there's still a lot more we don't know. So a lot of New York County people have ancestors that were guards at Camp Security. Uh, so there again, if you contact me, you can also contact me through the Friends of Camp Security website. Uh, and uh, there's, as I said, there's so much in both of subjects. There's so much information out there yet. So the more people that uh, come forward with what they know, uh, the more that we, we can all know. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Uh, anybody else have any, any projects you want, you want to pitch? Okay. Well, I'm going to, I'm introducing uh, Don Limebar, our speaker, but it'll be kind of a circuitous route here because I want to talk first about 
someone I've been interested in recently, his name's George Kennan, who was a Cold Warrior. Uh, he, mar he authored the Marshall Plan after World War II. He also put forth the theory of containment, which really was the abiding Cold War theory up until he basically said the Soviet Union is so corrupt that they'll eventually fall under their own weight. So we should do everything we can not to not not to uh, provoke a nuclear war because they'll eventually go away. And in fact, with the fall of the, of the Berlin Wall, that is uh, prophecy became true. But back again, I'm just wondering if his thinking isn't still correct. But that's another topic for another day. One of the reasons I'm interested in him is he had a summer home and really a second home in the East Berlin area of Adams County, which used to be in your county. Uh, before 1800. And he uh, bought a home there from a lumber uh, merchant here in New York, by the name of Joseph, P. Joseph Miller. And uh, he lived there for many years. Uh, finally, the family sold it just the last couple of years to uh, a longtime caretaker there. It was a major farmhouse. He was there. Not only was he there, but he was uh, came into the family and he was uh, he joined. He was part of the fire company. He would eat at the, uh, you know, the, the cafe there. He would help plant trees there. He was involved. So you have this. Uh, and he was also. I didn't mention this. He was also the American ambassador of the Soviet Union for uh, not a long period of time, but in 1951, I believe. So here he was. This this uh, very. Uh, probably the leading historian, one of the leading historians of the 20th century, living in rural Adams County, not, not 15 miles from here, and involved in the community. And I, I, I was teaching an OLLI class, and I asked the OLLI, what do you, do you know, members of the class, who do you know of Nash, that has a national reputation, a natural, national status that comes back here and contributes like that, like George Kennan did in his community regularly? And they thought a little bit, and they mentioned some some politicians, and I, I think you could argue politicians do that maybe for a lot of reasons that they, uh, that may not be uh, always uh, uh, pure. Uh, but they, I said, well, let me tell you who I would say. I, I would say uh, my pick would be uh, Don Leinbaum, who uh, is a full professor at University of Maryland, Professor of Historic uh, Preservation in a School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation. So he works down at the University of Maryland, and he has a, a, a farm in southern New York County, southeastern New York County, or Sewerstown. Not only that, but he's involved in this uh, south in the Sewerstown area historical side. He's one of the leaders for years, and not only that, but he does do, he does documentation work on buildings that are going to come down. And we'll see a sample of that tonight. But he also does preservation work to keep buildings standing in that community, in the Southeast New York County community. And uh, I don't think he has to do that. I, he has enough to do, I'm sure, down at uh, in uh, College Park. But he does that because, because he believes in community. He can tell you for himself, but I think it's because he believes in community. And, and he believes in participating in the community. So, I think, and what I, want, I meant to mention this about uh, about Kennan, but it still ties in here. I, I got this uh, a document from uh, from the East Berlin Historic Preservation Society, and this is a speech that Kennan gave, where he uh, and you can't see it very, I'm sure, but it's typed out on a typewriter, and then he gave this. It's about East Berlin's history. He talked about East Berlin's history to people in East Berlin which is very difficult to do if you were trying to do it. And not only that, he marked out stuff, he put it seriously, he went over it and, and not, and he had, for example, he had uh, about the Conewago Creek, it's a tributary of the, of the Susquehanna, much larger actually than a proper creek. They knocked, he knocked that out for whatever reason. So he, he didn't want to say that. So he could have just gone on there and ripped it off his typewriter and gone in and given the speech which he was adept at doing, he's very erudite, but here he was working the speech and you can see in his own handwriting how he did that. So I, that shows a deep commitment on Ken's part. I think what we'll see here tonight is a deep commitment on uh, Don Lineball's uh, part in, in his preservation work on the Ramsey Theater. And uh, so I, I've seen 
some version of this before, and it, it, it's wonderful. And I'm pleased that tonight, because we're live streaming it, you can see it, but also this will be on YouTube. So the the uh, the talk will be preserved, you know, for so forever. And isn't that the way the historical community can work? Was we can preserve this work from a very distinguished professor, and uh, and it'll be there for the ages. So, ladies and gentlemen, John Lonhold. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with this community uh, and the community online uh, in TV land, if you will, um, to uh, talk about a, a project that uh, I've been working on for several years now. Um, and I'm going to try to tell this story. Uh, it, it, it occurs to me that history often is, is uh, sort of meted out in individual frames, if you will, right? And those frames are often not connected. So I think this idea of connection and putting those frames in motion, very much like a motion picture does, is, is a really important way to think about how we can uh, move our work in, um, in historical narrative forward. So uh, with that, let me get back here, with that, Okay, so the story I'm going to tell about the Ramsey Theater is really a story that uh, uh, mirrors uh, a Hollywood blockbuster, right? We're going to talk about intrigue, we're going to talk about power, we're going to have a divorce, tragedy, and of course sex, because that sells in Hollywood, right? Um, but uh, I, again, I want to try to put this in the context of, uh, of a movie story. And our leading man uh, is Charles Ramsey. Uh, and Charles Ramsey was born in Maryland in Harford County uh, about 1879. Uh, his first work, his first job that we know about was at the First National Bank in Delta uh, in 1894. Uh, in 1901, he married Elizabeth Dodson, whose family were uh, from uh, the Delta area at the Slateville Presbyterian Church. And uh, Elizabeth had been living in Delta. Uh, her father, Rudolphus Dodson, was a dentist in the area, very well known. Um, the couple lived in Delta for a, for a little while. But we find out in 1902 uh, that Charles Ramsey left Stewartstown to assume the cashiership of the new People's National Bank in Stewartstown. Uh, so now uh, he relocates to Stewartstown, uh, not in the bank building you see there, that gets built a little bit later. Uh, and here he is right here in the back row of this uh, cast of characters who were officers and directors of the People's Bank. Uh, where he was working. Uh, we do have a couple of in inside shots of the teller's cage, which would have been his area as cashier of the, of the bank, right? Um, something interesting, though, is I was looking at this picture, and if you go in a little bit closer, you'll see uh, on the second floor was an office, and it was an office for Dr. Dodson, a uh, dentist. So this is Elizabeth's uh, father who clearly follows the couple to, um, uh, to Stewartstown. And in fact, if we look at the uh, 1910 census, uh, we see that uh, Charles Ramsey uh, and Elizabeth, and then his in-laws, the Dodsons, are all living together just down the street from the bank. Um, and he's listed as head of household. So uh, it's got the, uh, got the in-laws there with him in the house. Um, Ramsey continues at the bank up until the early 1910s, 19 teens, when he goes into business with Clay Anderson, who happened to be his next door neighbor and a uh, frequent uh, investor at the bank in all things uh, in, in the Stewartstown area. They opened up the Anderson Ramsey Auto Company, uh, which had 
uh, offices, uh, not only in Stewartstown, but in Delta and also in New Park, Mayor, or New Park Pennsylvania. So a uh, little bit about, about our uh, leading man. So Stewartstown first, Stewartstown's first movie mogul wasn't in fact uh, Charles Ramsey, it was this guy who is also in our cast of characters from the bank. Uh, this is Gus Neller, uh, who was a director of the bank. And it turns out that Gus owned the Neller building, which was right behind the bank, and in fact, sold the property at the corner that the, that the bank built their new building on uh, that you see here in 1905. This is the Neller, Neller building, uh, a wood frame building. And we believe here on the second floor was what was called Neller Hall. And this was a performance space uh, and eventually a theater space. Um, this is the only interior picture we have of Neller's Hall stage. Um, this is probably in the 1910 to 1915 range from what we can tell. Uh, but what's important here are a couple of the people in this play's cast. Uh, the first one here is Bess Bruninger. We'll be coming back to her in a, in a few minutes. And then her sister, uh, Laura Bruninger. Uh, and again, the Bruninger family is going to figure into uh, to some of the intrigue in the story. Um, Nellers Hall started as a, as a vaudeville venue, as many early movie theaters did. Uh, this is from uh, 1912. And uh, again, a little hard to read, but right there is the name George Bruninger. George is the father of Bess and Lena. And he also seemed to have been connected to and engaged in entertainment at Nellers Hall. Uh, at that point. Uh, the other thing we see farther down uh, is, is the fact that this vaudeville entertainment uh, had, uh, had uh, a blackface presentation, not unusual for the area from, from that time. Um, but uh, I think it, it you know, makes us think about the ways in which both entertainment and then the new movie industry uh, certainly uh, stereotyped uh, both uh, African Americans, uh, we'll see some movies uh, and talk about Native Americans and immigrants as well uh, during during this period. So it's it's not all fun and games, and we need to we need to sort of think closely as we go through. So how does Charles Ramsey get connected to movies? Well, I think it's this. Uh, newspaper ad right here that, that does it. And that is that Ramsey uh, makes arrangements with Neller to show a new movie, uh, how the, um, the Maxwell automobile is built. I'm sure this was just a fascinating silent movie. Um, uh, it's five reels, uh, which means it's a, it's a pretty significant uh, length production, full length production. But I think after doing this, uh, Ramsey saw the power of the motion picture and got more involved, right? Um, just have some, some newspaper articles indicating that Nellers Hall does go to motion pictures, uh, begins uh, selling or uh, showing silent movies. Uh, we've got a couple of programs from when they're doing that. Note that they, they advertise how many reels each, each film is, and one reel is generally 15 minutes during the silent uh, movie time. It, it eventually becomes one uh, later on. We, I, I was able to find one of these, the Indian Trapper's uh, Vindication. I found, found an image of, uh, of that from, uh, from about 1915. So that's Neller's Hall, that's the start of movies in Stewartstown, the messy divorce, right? So uh, Charles uh, Ramsey files for divorce in 1916, uh, and divorce is granted November 28th of 1916 from Elizabeth Ramsey. And interestingly, in less than 10 days, she packs up, according to this newspaper article from the Delta Herald, and takes everything and heads to Philadelphia. 
um, moves right away. And it appears, if we look at the census from a couple of years later, that the whole family went. Dr. Dodson, uh, her mother, and siblings all end up in Philadelphia. So the whole family once again travels the, first from Delta to Stewartstown and now from Stewartstown uh, to, uh, to Philly. Okay, this is in December of 1916. The other woman co-starring <laughs> Bessie Bruninger, who we talked about earlier, right? And here's Bessie. Um, January the 16th, right? Uh, less than six weeks after the divorce is final, they head to Philly, which seems a little weird too, but <laughs> that's another story, uh, to get married, right? So, uh, uh, and Ramsey starts his, his second family. This is actually the Bruningers, George, who I talked about earlier, who was in the Vaudeville show, and then uh, their children, Lena, George, and Ella Bess, who was on the right, that's that's Bessie. And Bruninger owned the New Leader Hotel in Stewartstown, which was the uh, the hotel of record, if you will, uh, the, the sort of newest uh, establishment in town. It was a temperance house, uh, which, again, is not unusual for the Stewartstown uh, area, perhaps, or for the lower end, as we like to call it, of York County. So the money money has to figure into this equation, right? It turns out that George Bruninger and his brother, Henry, uh, received a large inheritance from a rich uncle in Germany that they didn't even know. It's starting to sound a little like a monopoly game, right? Uh, you, you will receive $30,000 from a rich uncle. Well, it turns out that $30,000 in 1890 was about a million to a million and a half dollars today. So a pretty substantial amount of money, which I suspect uh, George had been working in a, um, in a tannery in Hartford County. And I suspect that money is what funded the purchase and the creation of the new leader hotel in Stewartstown and sort of a, a change of venue for their family. Interestingly, remember now it's only been a year since since uh, Charles married uh, the Bruninger girl, Bessie, right? Um, and Charles uh, immediately, uh, pretty soon, begins the process of building a, a new auto showroom in Stewartstown. Uh, really a state-of-the-art auto showroom. Uh, just a year after this, uh, after his marriage to Bessie and her quite well off father. So I'm, I'm thinking that at least as an investment, uh, George has a part in creating this auto dealership. And here's, uh, here's uh, uh, Charles on the right and Clay Anderson, his partner and next door neighbor on the left. So just a bit about the moving pictures at this point, right? Uh, they begin in the late 1880s, right? Uh, Thomas Edison's uh, kinetoscope, which is something that you actually individually looked into to see a motion picture. Um, by 1895, the vitoscope had been patented by Thomas Arnett, uh, which allowed you to project movies on the wall, okay? And most of these were shown in opera houses or vaudeville halls and that kind of thing, which had been built earlier for live stage shows, right? Uh, the first motion picture that we have record being shown was in a vaudeville theater in New York City in 1896. And then we had this rise of these things called Nickelodeons, uh, which were really a, a, a kind of storefront movie theater that lasted from about 1907 up to about 1914. And we're super important because what's happening during this period? A huge immigration from Europe, right? Particularly from Southern Europe of folks that don't speak English. The Nickelodeon was showing silent movies, right? The, the, the international language of watching 
the picture show, okay? So they didn't need uh, it to be narrated and it became very popular with immigrants during, during this period. So then we have the rise, the next thing that happens is the rise of the big movie palaces, right? Uh, often funded by the large film production companies in Hollywood. Uh, certainly the, the Strand and Capitol, which start uh, as slightly different things, the State Theater in Hanover. Uh, so we get these, these sort of amazing architectural uh, creations. But in small towns, uh, as we said, things start uh, pretty basically, right? We get opera houses, vaudeville halls, and the like. And if we think about uh, York County, particularly Southern York County, Nellers Hall in Stewartstown, uh, the Penmar Theater down in Cardiff or Delta starts out as a Masonic Hall. The Lyric Theater in, in uh, Dallas Town is a band hall. The Glen Theater in Glen Rock also a band hall. And then the Red Lion Opera House, which began showing movies in about 1921. Uh, so there was, there was a pretty quick adoption uh, in these small towns of folks beginning to show, uh, show motion pictures, right? Uh, just some, some quick shots of these, uh, uh, at least a couple uh, which are no longer uh, extant, and one that uh, the Glen Theater is currently uh, hopefully going oh, uh, undergoing some uh, uh, some renovation or preservation. Uh, and this same phenomenon happened in York, right? The Odd Fellows Hall, uh, I think at the corner of George and King, if I'm not mistaken, on the second floor was the Parlor Theater. Uh, so again, using these already built spaces, um, not specifically built for theaters. So the next step, starting in about the 1920s is the creation of small uh, purpose-built movie houses in Southern York County. And it turns out that the Ramsey, from what I can tell, is the first. About 1920, it's built in Stewartstown. New Freedom gets a movie theater in 1922. Uh, the Dallas Theater gets built in 1926 in Dallas Town, and not to be outdone, the Lion Theater, because those Red Lion folks don't want the Dallas Town folks to have a, a motion picture show, right? Uh, so it comes in at about 1926. Uh, here's some images of, of those theaters. Uh, the Lion Theater uh, is similar to what we'll see with the Ramsey does eventually get demolished uh, and for a parking lot, just like the Ramsey Theater. Unfortunately, here's the demolition in 1969 uh, for uh, a bank that's now off to the right, and that's the, the sort of main parking lot for the bank. I wanted to show this though, just uh, as, as the theaters and as the movies are coming to this, these small towns, I think this is a wonderful uh, quote about that first show, right? Um, the day the show came, stores closed, the blacksmith dropped his tongue, school let out, right? People went and drove, even the ministers and their wives went to the motion picture show. The opera house was packed, the opera house, right? It's not the movie theater yet. Uh, the house was darkened and suddenly glimmering light began to play on a canvas drop like a curtain across the stage, right? Uh, the town wag let out a whoop and everybody caught the spirit, the motion pictures were a go. Uh, I just think it's a great quote from that period to think about what that transformation must have been for people to have that first recorded, uh, that recorded movie. So let's talk a little bit. We've got the context set, where this shows up, talk a little bit about the Ramsey and the, and the creation of it. Um, we know that uh, in uh, early 1920, the process starts. Um, Initially, the, the papers report that Charles Ramsey purchases the property for uh, the building of the theater. Uh, but then by March, the newspapers are reporting Mrs. Charles Ramsey purchased the property. And in fact, if we look at the deed, uh, Bessie Ramsey did purchase the property. Um, and again, I think this is an indication that her father is involved in this process. It's not Charles Ramsey, getting title to this, it's Bessie 
And uh, I'm thinking, again, it seemed to be a family interested in entertainment, right? And invested, if you will, in entertainment. Um, if we move on, we have a, a, a quote that really kind of perplexed everybody. The Carpenters uh, have the Ramsey Apartment and Amusement Building ready for the placing of tile. And everybody was, what does that mean? Are these like little, you know, bathroom tiles that are applied to the outside? What, what is it? Well, it turns out that in looking at the demolition, uh, I focused in on one of these building units, right? Did a little bit of research, and it turns out it's something called structural terracotta, which was only used from about 1900 to 1925. It was a, it was really kind of produced like uh, cement blocks, cinder blocks, right? Uh, but it was using terracotta, which was, was a much denser and stronger substance. Uh, so uh, we solved, uh, solved that mystery a little bit. Uh, and you can see the, uh, that uh, terracotta tile as it, uh, as it shows here on the side of the building. By November of 1920, the Carpenters are finishing the Ramsey moving picture and apartment house. Um, and they're placing the chairs and soon the uh, first uh, performance by the Lyceum Singers is gonna take place. Uh, and and uh, the theater was beautifully decorated with ferns and crow's foot. By December, the advertisement for the first motion picture show in Stewartstown uh, is, is in the paper. The new picture theater near the square is going to show the Miracle Man on December the 23rd. And they note that the second floor of the theater will be occupied as apartments by the owner, Charles and Elizabeth, and Mr. and Mrs. George Bruninger. He's got his in-laws, uh, his second set of in-laws, living with him in this uh, new location. Um, the floor is sufficiently sloped and uh, comfortable regulation theater chairs are provided. And here's the uh, Stewartstown News advertisement for that first, uh, that first showing. Notice it's two shows, 7.30 and 9, and they did not charge for admission. This was a new thing, right? Uh, you want to get people in, involved, see what, what it's about, right? Um, so I, I was able to get into the theater once before it came down. Unfortunately, that was the only time. But using a whole bunch of photos that we had taken and that we were able to get historically, we were able to do a, a kind of reconstruction of what the theater looked like. We know it's it seated, excuse me, we. Uh, let me go back here. We know it seated 300 people, uh, had a lobby, uh, ticket booth. Uh, there was a projection room above the lobby and then entrance up to the second floor apartments. It did have a full usable stage uh, for those singing events and lyceum events, right? Uh, and then the, uh, the women's room, restroom, tucked under the stage and the men's under the uh, under the apartments, and again, if we if we look at this, that ceiling height of the main part of the theater is probably right about there. Uh, so it was a it was a pretty high ceiling, uh, large large space. These were the only pictures that I could get of the interior just before it went down. It was in tough shape, but boy, you could still see that it had at one point been an amazing space. And with the lights in here, it's a little hard to see, but uh, really wonderful decorative uh, gold painted tin uh, ceiling. So it was, you know, it had, had some movie palace um, uh, aesthetics to it for sure. This is the second floor and you can see it was really designed for two families who were related to live together because one apartment was all connected, but this apartment needed to come out into the hall and use the hall to move and even to move into the living room. So you would come up, either go into apartment one or apartment two sort of uh, became this area. So clearly really designed for, um, for 
families that were uh, that were related, uh, and we can see that that balcony and uh, very light uh, space with a lot of windows on the second floor. Here's again what it looked like uh, when we were able to get in just before uh, demolition. So uh, in addition to the theater, Charles also opened a restaurant and bowling alley underneath the theater uh, that continued for, for quite a few years. Uh, and that would have been down that outside had an exterior stair that went down so that it could operate even when the movies uh, weren't in, in place. And we do have one image of the pool hall under the theater. And guess what? There's George C. Berminger again on the left. Uh, the the uh, the father and father-in-law of the Ramses. So the movies. Let's talk a little bit about the movies. We we're very fortunate to be able to to figure out some of the the range of movies that uh, that were shown. The 1920s, of course, was the period of silent films, and we were able able to identify the woman that played piano along with the silent movies. Uh, it was Margaret E. Jones who graduated from Stewartstown High School in 1917, so would have been still in her teenage years when she started uh, uh, banging on the ivories to uh, to uh, produce some sound, first in Nellor Hall and then in the Ramsey Theater. The kind of shows, we talked about the Miracle Man, these were all black and white, all um, uh, and all silent movies, of course, the uh, the famous uh, Rudolph Valentino here on the on the right. Uh, I like the uh, the fact that uh, this uh, Rin Tin Tin movie, Rin Tin Tin, the dog gets top billing above any of the human actors, which is kind of uh, kind of cool, right? Still all black and white, and as we move through the twenties, and really the twenties was was the biggest growth in the movies, right? That sort of period of roaring twenties, people had. The, the money, it was still a new thing, and it's it's just going toward the sky. And because of that, local merchants said, wait a minute, we have a captive audience sitting there, right? So let's take advantage of that. So the movies also then started connecting to all these local businesses. So the Kramer brothers, who were both furniture sellers and undertakers, it turns out, um, we're selling Edison phonographs, right? What better way to, to sell an Edison phonograph and bring it into the theater? And uh, I'm guessing Miss Jones, who was playing piano, wasn't there that night, right? Uh, and so they ran the Edison, uh, the Edison phonograph uh, instead for the audience to, to sell those. Uh, the other thing was local merchants cre literally created ads. And these were colored glass slides, and we have a whole collection of them at the Stewartstown Historical Society. So here's one for the local First National Bank. These would have been projected while they were changing the reels on the projector, okay? Um, one for wallpapers, one for college girl girdles. Uh, this covered the whole, the whole range, right? Parker pens. Uh, and I don't think I want to buy this weather stripping, but uh, uh, interest, some interesting ads, let's say, uh, in there. So the movies of the 1930s, right? Of course, what comes in the 1930s? Sound, right? Uh, Warner Brothers, uh, Vitaphone becomes the first talkies, right, that, that, we, that we see. And Al Jolson, uh, the jazz singer, becomes uh, the sort of hit. There is talking paper. That was 1929 plus or minus. Um, the next year, 
right? Stewartstown installs RCA Victor equipment to add sound to the Stewartstown movie theater. And uh, we're off at the races, if you will. And we learned that the first uh, talking, singing spectacular was called uh, Rio Rita. Uh, here's the, uh, the movie poster for that, 1929. Black and white, but the finale is now in Technicolor. So we start to get Technicolor coming in right at the end uh, of the 20s and early 30s. Again, a spectacular transformation. If we think of the Wizard of Oz, right? The whole first half in black and white and that change to Oz with color. And that was uh, another one of these transformative moments in motion picture history. So uh, interesting though, uh, the shows that we know that they're showing still continue to be in black and white. The, the uh, Technicolor movies uh, were more expensive for the theaters to show, for, for sure. Uh, so it takes a while for them to be adopted. Kate Hepburn and Little Women, which is hand, interestingly hand-colored. Can you imagine hand-coloring those strips of celluloid, obviously multiple copies of those to send out to theaters across the country? Well, what happens to movie theaters uh, as we move into the 1930s? Where does attendance go? Straight down with the depression, right? Ticket sales plummet, as you can imagine, because this is, uh, these are expendable types of, uh, of, of expenses, right? So what do the movie theaters have to do? They have to figure out how to get more people into the theater. This is where the double feature appears. Uh, in the early 1930s, the idea of a two for one uh, is a way to draw people in. Another interesting way is through something called bank nights. Anybody ever heard of bank nights? Uh, so if you bought a ticket, your ticket had a number, and the movie theater at the end of the show would do a drawing, and you might walk away with $5 in cash, which in the middle of the Great Depression was was quite a thing. And this became hugely popular across the country. And again, if we go to the York Daily Record, we find out that the city of York was actually considering banning these bank nights because they thought it was gambling. Uh, but the, uh, the uh, Chief Burgess of Stewartstown said, uh, we're continuing, we don't, we don't think these are gambling. And so bank nights uh, continued in Stewartstown, but it was another one of these ways to draw in customers at a time when uh, it was it was difficult for the theater. Well, the 1930s, of course, ends with a sound and Technicolor spectacular, right? Gone with the wind. Um, here's this is actually the program from the Stewartstown uh, Ramsey Theater, as you'll see in the second part here. Uh, shown May 24th and 25th. And if you look at the note down there, they are, they are very clear that not one inch of the film has been left out. This is the full deal and you're gonna see it in Stewartstown in full color and sound. So a, 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 pretty, uh, a pretty important uh, moment. I'm going to You were uh, the last time the was going to be the central head, we did or we are. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, again, uh, certainly uh, a moment that shows up in the newspaper in Stewartstown three or four times uh, for the arrival of, of, of Um 
So what else happens in the 1930s? Uh, we have a happy time. We have a birthday party for then six-year-old uh, Ruth Ramsey, who is the only child of Charles and Bessie. There's Ruth right in the middle. Uh, but this wonderful uh, scene of, of kids from the mid-30s, right? Uh, basically, the theater becomes their, their birthday uh, site. And it even gets covered in the newspaper. Uh, they got to see a movie and play some games. And then the local photographer took that picture, which interestingly is one of only a couple that we have during the theater's actual operation. We also have a tragedy in the 1930s. Uh, sadly, uh, Mrs. Bruninger, that would be George Bruninger's wife, and it would be Bess's mother, and his mother-in-law falls off the back balcony, almost 20 feet, and is killed in the fall. And he didn't find her for several hours. She would have been fell off in this area back here. And because the second floor was raised to create the, the height for the theater, um, it, was, it was really probably an unsurvivable fall, particularly for somebody who was uh, already 80. Uh, so uh, a, a little tragedy in the story. George continues to live uh, with the, the Ramses uh, until Charles uh, dies, and then he kind of moves on. Uh, the movies in the 40s, uh, Wild Bill Hickok Rides, and I show that because uh, we actually have an image of, of that on the marquee, which, it, it, again, is one of just a couple of these uh, images. This is Dr. Free, who was still driving his uh, horse-drawn carriage in town in the 1940s. Uh, uh, a little retro, uh, if, I guess. What else did we have? Uh, certainly continuing in black and white, but of course all sound now. Uh, Roy Rogers and, uh, and Trigger. And then in the late 40s, Charles Ramsey dies. Bess continues to run the theater up until the mid 1950s. Here's Bess in 1951, which was the uh, centennial of, in Stewartstown. Uh, and this was this was uh, part of that, uh, and we think that's for Showboat, uh, that movie poster over on the on the right or on the left there. The movies in the 1950s, uh, as Bess gives up the theater. Uh, a new owner takes over in 1957, uh, brings in Abbott and Costello, and of course in color, uh, uh, Elvis and, uh, and his shaking and shimmying. I've got a little clip from Loving You. Loving You. of Frankenstein, that one still keeps me up at night. Uh, we have Tarzan movies coming in in the 1950s. Again, we're pretty much all color uh, by, uh, by this, this period. And it's not too long until the theater closes, right? Uh, about 1967 or 1968. Uh, the theater at this point is, is actually doing some live music shows, but not really showing movies uh, any longer. Uh, it then becomes a an auction house, uh, so we get um, uh, we get a, a, a theater building actually being used for a for a different purpose at this point. This is the theater in the 1980s, and all through this time, even though the theater is closed, the apartments upstairs are still rented out, and we were able to contact a couple of couples that that started their housekeeping together. 
uh, in, in that those apartments upstairs. Uh, here it is still in pretty good shape in 1992 with a good roof. Oop, one way here. And then really that's uh, coming to the end of the of the picture. 2022 is when the theater goes down. Uh, the, the town uh, took the theater through essentially through eminent domain because the owner was not keeping it up. They convinced themselves that the building couldn't be saved, unfortunately, even against the advice of, of some of us. Um, and it was just ready to fall down, right? And so the deconstruction began, and guess what? It took them twice as long to tear it down as they estimated because those terracotta tiles were so strong that they had to bring in extra equipment to bring this building down, which uh, again, sort of made, made some of us feel good in a sense <laughs> that, uh, that we knew the building itself was solid. The inside was a mess but it could have easily been, uh, been renovated. Uh, so this went on for over a week uh, to bring the building down um, to what you see here, sort of the last, uh, the last picture. And the end of the story. And, uh, just the thanks to some of the people that helped do the research and be happy to entertain questions, uh, comments. Yes. Uh, you indicated that you only were only able to get in there one time to photograph. Mm -hmm. I imagine there's a story around that, but, and I bring that up because in Springsbury, we wanted to photograph the inside of a barn that's coming down. The owner said, we don't want you to do it because you might find something to store. <laughs> so <laughs> in, in this case, um, it had actually been put on the market. So there was a realtor uh, who was opening it for potential uh, interested parties. And so several of us went to see it as interested parties, okay. right? And were able to get in. But I mean, it was extreme. The inside was extremely unsafe, frankly. Um, I'm, I'm surprised they, they let folks in. The owner had let the roof go, and once the roof goes, everything inside goes. Uh, so the second floor, as you walked along, you had to step over large holes that went straight down into the auditorium and could have been uh, a situation like uh, Mrs. Bruninger faced. So we, uh, we didn't spend much time in it. Mm -hmm. And and then it was pulled off the market. The owner at the time had uh, taxes and arrears, and that's when the, the town took it and decided that we needed another parking lot. Yeah, I'm unfortunate for yeah. sure. But any other questions, comments? Oh, yeah. Um, did you get any estimates? You, I, I assume there were a group of you who were trying to preserve it. Uh, did you have any idea of what it would have taken to restore it? Yeah, it, I mean, it would have been it would have been a significant investment. We had a couple of developers actually from Maryland who were interested in in it, um, and the idea being that uh, essentially updating and recreating the two apartments upstairs and having the first floor as a, like a community. Uh, theater space, uh, and then have those apartments essentially pay for the whole building, yeah, right? right. Um, and we had somebody pretty close, and uh, he backed out. And after that, the those of us that were left uh, didn't didn't have the the financial wherewithal or couldn't get that investment together. So yeah, it was it was unfortunate in that sense. I have a couple of leaves of kind of on the. The tangential, but sure. the uh, temperance house. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not familiar with them, with temperance movement, and right as it played out in your county, but a temperance house. Yeah, so I mean, just essentially a hotel that you know that makes it clear that they don't either don't serve and don't allow alcohol on the premises. So sort of supporting the the broader temperance movement. Um, which again, uh, Stewartstown was dry up in, I mean, even when we lived there in the 
early 2000s, uh, the borough itself. So uh, there, there clearly was a tradition of, of, of that in the area. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard of the Aldine, Aldine Hotel in Spring Grove was such right well right that's interesting and it's interesting in his ads you know he says if you want to maintain a temperance house in town please come and you know and use our services because uh we're not going to be able to maintain uh this kind of uh facility if you don't right don't don't go down to the tavern at the corner uh and, and drink the other thing was have you heard in your studies about uh, churches uh, showing motion pictures. Uh, I, I understand that in some old churches, maybe there still are old screens or projectors and that are large that would entertain large numbers of people. Yeah, I I didn't come across okay. anything like that for a work that I did in, in York. Um, I mean, I could see that, you know, if you sort of think of that building type, right? Um, that that they used early on large, you know, opera houses, fraternal organization halls, uh, you know, churches. It makes some sense in that in that way. You know, there was a movement sort of against the early movies and Hollywood, and you know, the, the uh, particularly the you know, the sex and violence. And, and uh, so I could see churches maybe not, you know, wanting to, to host that, but I, I don't have any specific data. Yeah. Okay, uh, I remember two things that I've connected with that. When I was a kid, uh, New Harmony Presbyterian at the Bro, uh, we, uh, I remember uh, that we did have a screen and like the Christian Endeavor, you know, like the young people's movement, that there would be like a really religious type films. I, re I remember, you know, St. Paul, uh, when he was in prison, you know, that right, was the right. thing. And another thing is um, my father was very active in their uh, men's brotherhood. And, uh, as, and I remember as part of those meetings, uh, my dad, they had a projector because my dad would, uh, they would help show like uh, Abbott and Stella as, mm -hmm. as part of the entertainment too. So that's two instances in like the the nineteen fifties where uh, the churches would have had motion pictures. Yeah, and I think they certainly had sort of the sixteen millimeter sort of size projector, which is what I remember in school, right, in elementary school, you know, having movies shown, um, but. It's a big investment to get that that thirty two millimeter full size film projector set up, and so I I'd be a little surprised to, to to see it in a in a church setting. I'm not sure. I had a question. You had you had a slide um, or an ad from the newspaper for uh, Kramer Brothers, which you said was um, a funeral company that went in or a funeral home that went into furniture. Or actually, maybe vice versa. Yeah, they, they did um, both, as as many. Uh, right. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Furniture store. Yeah. Symbiotic. Right. Industry. Right. Yeah. Were they based in Stewartstown? I don't know if they were based in Stewartstown. They actually took over uh, a furniture business that um, had been owned uh, by another family previously. Okay. And so I'm not 100% sure if they were local or if they were buying, you know, coming in from somewhere else and oh, I starting see. starting the Kramer Brothers chain. I don't yeah, know. I was just yeah. curious because um, the town where I live in, Anvil, which is in Lebanon County, but um, the Kramer family operates, to this day operates a funeral home on one end of town and the other part of the family operates a furniture store. Huh. So I don't know if it's the same family. It's the same it, spelling, which is it, even more. It, that's it. Well, we should we should get together and talk about that. Okay. But I, I, they did leave Stewartstown, and okay. and now that I think about it, I think there was a report that they went, you know, still stayed in Pennsylvania, but oh, wow, went, uh, okay. out a little. So yeah, okay, that, that would be cool to, to be able to track that. Yeah, um, the Red Lion Opera House. 
Now, did they just call it an opera house and it was a theater, or was there actual operas being well, in their mind? Yeah, again, I think the opera house was a, a kind of hopeful name that was assigned. So it, it probably would have been live entertainment, right, of various kinds, uh, often vaudeville kinds of things, but but also, um, you know, singing groups, quartets, uh, both, you know, uh, sacred and uh, so, it, yeah, I think it would have been a mix of things. I'm, I'm not sure, you know, Oscar, yeah. uh, what showed up in, in Red Man. Mm -hmm. um, I'm guessing not, but um, yeah, yeah. But those, un unlike, you know, the like the Fulton, let's say, which which may well have had, mm -hmm. but even there, my sense is that, that most of those were, it was really sort of local regional entertainment. With a high flute. It's interesting how many of those, these places have remained. Like the uh, the Red Line Opera House is still there at Town Apartments, and, right. uh, but you know the uh, Bonkies is in the place in uh, New Freedom, right? And you the know, uh, yeah. Mount Wolf still is a church now. Yeah. It's they were, must have all been pretty well built. I, I think they were. They were they were built to last. Steve, you. Uh, you gave a talk on I think, tips on historic preservation about maybe six, seven years ago. Very possible. Yeah. <laughs> it was from the Stewart's town. Yeah, 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 I did. I thought, I thought it was very interesting. Are you going to do that again? Uh, I, I hadn't thought about it, but now that I have a request, yeah, maybe we can okay. maybe we'll put it in another one. So it was focused on doing essentially doing house history research. House history so research, identifying the right. stacks. Yeah. 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 And, and uh, yeah, which is something yeah. actually. Yeah. 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 Good. Good memory. Yeah. 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 Uh, we will, we will look into that. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you all in this room and thank you all out there in TV land uh, for tuning in. Um, and uh, please, if you have other questions, you can reach out through uh, through the uh, the group here, right? Um, and uh, through Facebook. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John, and thank you everyone that came tonight and watched online. Um, we don't have our next talk set up yet, but we will be back with another talk in the new year. So thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Really interesting. Yeah.